boy, it's not, it's just not fair having to follow that. <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much. What a wonderful day of worship we've already had. And uh, I want to just pray with you right now that God would continue to speak. So let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, oh Lord, there's many reasons that have brought us here to this place today. Maybe some of us are just passing through. Uh, maybe some are visiting for the first time. Maybe we've been coming here many times and and this is our regular church home. But Father, we're all here for a reason. And Lord, you have a message for us. So I pray that your words would be heard. We have prayed, we have given, we have listened, we have sang. And now, Lord, please speak that we would hear your voice. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath. It is good to be with you and to have this opportunity to to speak with you from God's Word and to, to share some stories and uh, words of encouragement, I hope, uh, that will be a blessing to everyone. In a way, this message has been 19 years in the making, because on May 4th, 2004, my daughter Timory was born, and from that time until now, we have known the day is going to come when she's going to grow up. And she's going to leave and go to wherever. It just so happens that she's going to Union College. And, you know, when your kids go to college, you don't know what's going to happen after that. You know, she may meet a young Indian man and say, Mom, Dad, life is taking me to another place to live. No, we're talking Union. A young farmer. <laughs> And I just don't know how many more opportunities I'm going to have to, to share a thought um, in context with my daughter's presence here. So I'm dedicating this message to Timory, and I hope you'll allow... Hey, if the Osinias can, can show off their kids, <laughs> all right, give me a, an opportunity here to dote on my daughter just for a second. And uh, Timory, I thought of you when I was writing this message. I am uh, thinking of you as I present... Um, that was just uh, last week, these pictures, I think, not too long ago. I like this picture because my father-in-law, when she was little and she would smile like that, he would say, man, she looks like she's full of the devil. <laughs> just that big old grin. Oh, my goodness, it goes by so fast, doesn't it? And then all of a sudden, she's grown. So, you know, with camp meeting and graduation, I just don't know. I uh, don't know how many more times uh, I'll be able to speak to my daughter. So this is in dedication of Timory. Um, I do have a kid's quiz. Oh, before that, just to, to segue in, the Bible says children are a gift. They are a gift from God. They are a reward from God. So they may not always feel that way, <laughs> but God blesses us with our kids. If I could have a couple of trained, technical, microphone, skilled engineers, that would be great. Are you helping too, David? Awesome. Let's see, is this one a good one? All right. For the kids' quiz today, I'm looking at um, stories involving resurrection. So if you want to help out, raise your hand and we'll call on you. How many people does Jesus raise from the dead in the Gospels? Jesus himself raise from the dead. I see a Don in the back there. Toby's going there, David. One, three, five, Toby. <laughs> that would be you. D. D, he says seven. Good guess, but it's not D. And if you don't know, obviously it's a guess. All right, Dylan? Is the blue one working? Or? D. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Dylan. I want to hear your D. voice. C, five. Nope. <laughs> Not C either, so we've narrowed it down. We've done the 50-50 now. I see, oh, uh, Anna. A. A. We're bouncing around it. It's not A, it's not C, and it's not D. So, it's B. Andre, you're so intelligent. Man, how you have learned your Bible. I love it. You know, we get the idea that Jesus, uh, and I understand, Adon, you know, going with D, we get the idea that everywhere Jesus went, he was just doing miracles and raising people left and right. In reality, it wasn't that many. It's only three that we know of. 
uh, the, 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 the gospel records. And of course, I'm not talking about those who raised at his, at his resurrection. And there were some other resurrections um, that are referenced in the gospels, but three stories that the gospels tell us about. So now let's t- talk about those three in the next couple questions. Who did Jesus raise from the dead during his own funeral? I mentioned this last week, actually, in my sermon. So we're really going to find out who the good children are right now. <laughs> who did Jesus raise from the dead during his own funeral? All right, Andre's got his hand up. Lazarus. No, it's not Lazarus. Yeah, don't listen to mom. She'll lead you astray, apparently. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, it wasn't you. <laughs> Come on, young people. Dylan, are you raising your hand or are you scratching your head? Mom, dad, you can help out. I'll give you a hint. It was a widow's son. Wow, we're really struggling with this one. There's only three of these stories. Wow. Come on. Help out. Somebody help out. All you teens in the back, you count. Yeah, I see Ezekiel's head snap up. Who oh, is he talking to me? All right, Denise, you want to help? The son from the widowed woman. She was a woman, you're right. Oh. And she had a son. Where was she from? That's the word. Do you remember the name of the town? Okay. Okay, Isaiah, la- last chance. We're going to give Isaiah. Oh, hang on, boys. Just a minute. What did he say? Widow of Nain, thank you. The son of the widow of Nain. It's not, it, it, it is one of those stories that passes by somewhat quickly when you read it in Luke. I can understand if it's not one of those major stories, but it is a resurrection. All right, um, Jacob and Owen, you're going to help us out here. Who did Jesus raise from the dead after his funeral when he was already in the tomb? All right, Jacob. Lazarus. Lazarus. Sorry, Andre. Yeah, that was where you were thinking first. But that was Lazarus. He's already buried, already in the tomb. Funeral's over. And Jesus. That's the more dramatic one we think of when we think of resurrections. This is the one we reference most during uh, funeral services, the hope of the resurrection, things like that. Last one. Who did Jesus raise from the dead before her funeral when she was only 12 years old? Kind of, Kind of know the context of this story. We don't know her name, but who is she? All right. I see Abel. Jairus' daughter. Man, did you hear it? Sorry, Dylan. I, I, think, I think Abel got it. Jairus' daughter, 12 years old, don't know her name, never given, but we know her father's name is Jairus, and she is the little girl that's raised when she's 12 years old. Last question. To that little girl, Jesus said the words, Talitha Kum. That's where the sermon title comes from. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says the words, Talitha Kum. And then he translates the words. What do those words mean? Is it, I am the life, you are healed, be free and live, or little lamb, arise? All right. Give it, give it on a chance. A. It's not A. Abel? B. It's not B. Owen? D. Owen is correct. Talitha Kum. It is, it is a, oh, and David, Toby, wonderful job. Thank you for, for doing that. That's the end of the quiz. We'll talk a little bit about it. It's not specifically what it means, but it is a colloquial phrase used in the Aramaic that Jesus speaks to the little, to the little girl that means something along the lines of little lamb, arise or get up or awake even. So that's the story I want to look at with you today. So... Um, We're going to look at this story from the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to give an overview of the story to make sure we kind of understand the quick context of it. Then I want to get into the story itself with you this morning. And then what does it mean? What is the message? How do we apply it to our lives today? What what is uh, uh, the blessing that God wants us to think about or a blessing that God wants us to think about in connection with this story? So I'm going to jump right into it with the overview. This is the only resurrection of Jesus that takes place in all three of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them record this story. Luke is the only one that references the widow of Nain, and John is the only one that references Lazarus. So it's interesting how the gospels record this story just in general to note that. Um, 
And it's also important to note that this story of the raising of the little girl is always in connection with the woman who had the issue of blood as well. If you remember the story of the woman, she had an issue of blood and she thought, if I just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I'll be healed. So if you remember that story, that is what precedes Jesus. He's actually with Jairus at the time. Okay? All three stories talk about how Jairus comes to him first and says, Lord, my daughter, you got to come heal her. I mean, she's at the point of death. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come. And then the woman reaches out in the crowd, touches the hem of his garment. Now, these two stories are put in parallel, not just because they're sequentially uh, listed that way in Scripture, but because the two stories provide a contrast and a, and a, a wonderful way of, uh, of just looking how, how God and how Jesus works when he's doing miracles in the New Testament. So we have a woman and a girl healed in this story. One is dealing with 12 years of death. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. They, she could not be healed. That was a sign of death. She was considered as someone who was dead. If, you, if, you, if she was to touch someone, it would be like someone touching a dead body and they would be ceremonially unclean. So in a way, she's been dealing with 12 years of death, while with the little girl, she's 12 years of life. She's only 12 years old. Those two things are set in comparison and contrast. One is a chronic illness, one that's just continuing on and on the issue of blood. One is an acute sickness. It's getting worse and worse and worse to the point of death. One is done in public. The woman touches his, the hem of his garment in a large crowd, and Jesus stops in the middle of that crowd and says, who touched me? And the disciples say, Lord, there's so many people here. And then Jesus says, oh, you, the woman did it. And so it's a public thing, whereas with the little girl, it's not just private, but even after the miracle, Jesus says, now keep it a secret. So you have these two things. Why is one in public and even the greater miracle that of resurrection, you would think that would deserve even more public announcement, but in that case, Jesus says, keep it private, keep it um, secret. One is the touch of faith. The woman, without even talking to Jesus, without even asking for him, uh, she just knows because of her, her understanding of Jesus, if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I just touch the tassel that hangs down, I'm going to be healed. So one is the story of a touch of faith, while the other is a story of a touch of mercy. When Jesus comes to the little girl, she, he takes her hand and he blesses her and speaks with her. And then both involve the words of Jesus in connection and those two words after the miracles or before the miracles are significant. So these stories, uh, the reason why it's important to have an overview of this is to understand the context and that, realize that these two stories are related. But I'm going to focus more on the little girl, okay? So we're going to come to the story in Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 35, Okay? So knowing all of these things that have happened, Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house. The woman has touched him. He said, who touched me? I felt power go out for me. And the woman says, oh, it was me. And, and he says, uh, your faith has healed you, O daughter. Um, you're now healed of your affliction. Okay, so Mark 5, 35 says, now while Jesus is still speaking these words, while he is delayed, while he is speaking to the woman, they came from the house of the synagogue official from Jairus' house saying, your daughter has died. So literally what Mark is saying here is in the time it took for Jesus to bless this woman, to be touched by the woman, and to stop, during that time, Jairus' daughter dies. And this little delay and this little contrast is there uh, for us to think about and evaluate. And I'm sure Jairus, when he came to Jesus, he knew that his daughter was close to death. And we'll explain that in just a minute. He knew that his daughter was close to death. Now, when you know one of your loved ones is suffering, does every second matter? You know, and you've heard the saying before, when seconds matter, uh, you know, the police are minutes away or something like that, right? You can imagine that while Jesus stopped, so Jairus is with Jesus, Okay? And they're going to his house, and he's like, come on, hurry up, Jesus. I mean, it's so serious. It's so significant that when Jesus stopped, it bothered Jairus. It probably was like, okay, Lord, I understand, but, but you don't know. It's, it's, you got to hurry up. But does, does Jesus know what he's doing? He knows what he's doing. But in the time it took Jesus to stop, in the time it took him to say, okay, who touched me? And oh, the crowd is pressing around. You can read those few verses in 15, 20 seconds. But in reality, it was probably several minutes. And those minutes must have tortured Jairus. So while he's still speaking, they come from the house of Jairus and they say, I'm sorry, but your daughter has died. And I'm sure that was just a devastating moment to Jairus. And then this statement is made, why trouble the teacher anymore. Very interesting. Why 
trouble the teacher. Okay, they believed that a teacher sent by God could do wonderful things. And they probably heard many of the stories. Jairus clearly believed that Jesus had, had the power to, to, uh, to, to bless and heal and, and um, uh, cure the sickness in his daughter. But the synagogue officials, or excuse me, those who came from the, his house, obviously didn't understand who Jesus was because they thought, you're troubling him, and there's now nothing more he can do. You see, teachers and those sent by God, they can heal and they can bless. Priests can bless. All right? Prophets can prophesy, but no one can deal with death. Once death comes, there's nothing that can be done. So why trouble the teacher anymore? I just want to tell you, on a side note, you will never trouble Jesus with your requests. Jesus is never troubled by your needs. Do you hear that? Do you believe that? Jesus is never troubled. That's why he was not in a hurry, by the way. You know, Jesus is a busy guy in the Gospels, but he's never in a hurry. I wish I had that. <laughs> Do you ever feel like your life is just totally in a hurry? Jesus was never in a hurry. Busy, lots of things to do, but he's not in a hurry. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And it's almost like Jesus making the statement, that doesn't stop me from doing what we're going to do here. I'm not afraid of death. I know what the answer is here. Don't be afraid, believe. Don't be afraid. So that's a beautiful promise from Jesus. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now, the thing that's important to note here about Peter is Mark is not here in this story. Okay, Mark was not one of the disciples. He may have been among a larger group that was, you know, aware of the workings of Jesus. But Mark was not a first, first-hand witness to this story. But Peter was. And historically, we have come to understand that Mark was probably a follower or a disciple of Peter. And he gets his information about the Gospels from Peter. So in a way, Mark is the Gospel according to Peter. Okay? So it was Peter who was there. It was Peter who saw what happens next. And it's Peter who tells Mark about this story that Mark would later write down. Okay? So that's why it's good to know, because this is a very private moment that comes up. So they, they came to the house of the synagogue official, and they saw a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing. Now, this is important to understand a little bit of the cultural context of mourning among the Jews in the first century. These people that were weeping and mourning, they were not relatives, they were not neighbors or close friends. These are paid Jewish mourners, okay? This was an industry in the first century where people offered their services to those doing funerals or those near to death who would uh, perform the service of weeping and wailing and playing of flutes when someone had died. Now, I know that sounds a little odd to the way we do things today, but it's really not that dramatically different than, you know, using a funeral service and then, you know, paying to have an organist play Amazing Grace or something like that. But these were not family members. These are paid workers, that are now weeping and wailing. And in the Jewish custom, so this tells you right away that Jairus knew his daughter was near to death. He'd already hired the weepers. He'd already hired the flute players. They're already in his home, likely before he even went to see Jesus. Okay? And there's lots of uh, anecdotes and, and hypotheticals about why Jairus went, why he didn't send a servant and all that. But I want you to just to know that there, there is a highly orchestrated process of grieving among the Jews during this time. You would hire weepers, hire flute players, so that at the moment of death within the Jewish community, a large wail would go out throughout, through the home. Women typically would offer a loud wail that would last several minutes, by the way. Two, three, four, even five minutes, there would be a loud wail in the house of someone where someone had died. And this was a way of letting the neighbors in the community know that something dramatic and drastic and terrible has happened in the home. Then the flutes would play. Matthew talks about the presence of flutes in this story. The flute has always been associated, I'm not, not to say that our flute players that play in the, the school bands don't have uplifting, wonderful sounds, but flutes have along because of the sounds and the wails that you can make with the flute has often been associated with grieving. Even today, uh, uh, bagpipes 
You know, whenever you think of a funeral or even in movies, whenever they play Amazing Grace to make it uh, dramatic, uh, it's always bagpipes played because they create such a mournful sound to them. The, so the flute players are there, the weepers are there. In Jewish custom, there were several different rules about how to rend your garments to show that you were grieving. I'm not going to go into that to, uh, right now. During the period of grieving, um, and again, just to understand the culture, you were not allowed to read the scriptures. You weren't allowed to read the Bible when you were grieving. Because the rabbis taught that the very act of reading the scriptures was an act of joy. And you can't do an act of joy while you're grieving. So it's interesting. However, you could read Job, Jeremiah, and Lamentations. You were allowed to read those uh, because those are, those are sad books. So you could read those. They also had a very interesting custom. And again, just to show you how orchestrated and, and detail-oriented they were when it came to death and grieving, they had a custom in the first century in the house of someone had died, after they had died, you would have to pour out all your water, and everyone within a three-house radius around you would also have to pour out their water. And the reason for this was a legend and a myth that when the angel of death came to, to deliver the death blow to those who died, he would dip his sword in water to purify it before he made that strike. Okay, now this is not in the Bible or it's not an actual teaching, but this was part of the myth and the legend of death. So you would never want to drink, and you didn't know whose water the angel had dipped his sword in, so you didn't want to drink or bathe or cook with that water. So everyone within a three-house radius would have to dump out their water and get fresh new water because you didn't know at which pot that angel may have dipped his sword in. Very interesting. So there is all of this built into the thinking, all of this built into the culture of death and grieving. And when Jesus comes into the house, he sees a commotion, he hears the flutes, he hears the wailing, and he says this, why make a commotion and weep? Now there are things that Jesus does in the Bible that at times we say, now that's just kind of mean. That's really not fair. Uh, you, you heard someone ever use the phrase, um, Captain Obvious, right? Why make a commotion? It doesn't fit in this context. Anyone standing by there would have been like dumbfounded and like, um, because a little girl just died. What kind of question is that anyways? It's very similar, I, I think, to when Jesus is with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and the great storm comes upon them, and they're all afraid, and, and they say, Jesus, you know, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus asks the question, why were you afraid? Right? Um, because there was a storm. What kind of question is that? Why were we afraid? But you know, every time the Lord asks a question, Old Testament, New Testament, anytime he asks a question, it's because he's wanting us to think right? And in the connection with the storm, Jesus was trying to tell them, why are you afraid? Don't you know that someone greater than the storm is with you? Have I been with you so long that you haven't? I'm greater than the storm, right? And so when Jesus asks this question, it's kind of, again, it's not him just kind of poking, poking the bear, or just kind of trying to be obnoxious. He's saying, look, someone greater than death has just walked into the house, I am here with the power of life. I am the Messiah. There's no need for the commotion. Now, obviously, they didn't understand that. But he even says, goes further and say, why weep? Now, I want to be careful on this because some people have come away from this story and said, you should never cry then at a funeral. Jesus said, why weep? But don't forget that Jesus himself wept at Lazarus' tomb. So this is not a universal statement. This is a moment in time where Jesus is trying to make a dramatic uh, a pronouncement about who he is. And in the presence of Jesus, in that moment, knowing who he is, Jesus says, now is not the time for commotion and weeping because the power of life and resurrection is within me. And we're about to see that manifested. And then the next thing Jesus says can also be confusing at times. Again, at first glance, it almost looks like a, like a lie. The child has not died. Now, had she died? If she hadn't died, it wouldn't have been a resurrection, right? She had died. But Jesus says, from the viewpoint of heaven... From the perspective of the Father, from the perspective of eternal life, the end has not come for this little girl. This is not the death 
that is the final death. This is more like a sleep. This little girl has not died, but she's asleep. In the eyes of heaven, in the eyes of the Messiah, this little girl has not died. She can be awakened. And of course, they don't understand what he's saying, and they began laughing at him. This is not a nervous kind of laughter. This is a mocking, scornful laughter. You are a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. You have no place here. They began laughing at him. But putting them out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child is. So he enters into this very private, secret moment with the little girl that we don't even know her name. And it says, taking the child by the hand. So it shows a level. Jesus doesn't just stand over the bed, you know, in great proclamation. This is a very intimate moment. He does what is unceremonially uh, allowed. He touches a dead body, making him impure, so ceremonially impure. Of course, he himself is purity. So he cannot become ceremonially impure uh, in, in an eternal sense. But he takes the child by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum. Now, I imagine, and, and Mark knows that he's now writing in a different language. That is not Greek anymore. He's now made an Aramaic phrase, and then he translates it for the benefit of those who don't know Aramaic and are reading this in Greek. He translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. But I imagine when Peter was telling this story to Mark, he was like, Mark, I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget the words that Jesus spoke. And I'm not going to tell you those words in Greek. I'm going to tell you those words in Aramaic. Jesus held that little girl's hand, leaned over her lifeless body, and then said, maybe whispered it, Talitha Kum. Now, I just want you to try whispering Kum. And it almost requires you to deliver a puff of your breath to say it. Talitha kum. And as the air and words and breath left the body of Jesus and washed over her body, touched her flesh, the word of Jesus, the breath of Jesus, the life and resurrection of Jesus entered into that little girl. And Mark says, immediately the girl got up and began to walk, because she's 12 years old. And immediately they were completely and naturally and understandably astonished. Talitha Those were the exact words, not the translated words, the exact words spoken by Jesus to resurrect a 12-year-old girl. Now we step back and we say, that's a lovely story. This is chicken soup for the soul. I love it. Jesus blesses a little child. He raises up the dead. My, oh my. Love it. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad for that promise that you have the power. Should I need it? Should that experience come into my life? I know exactly where to go. Or should we all perish one day before your return? You, oh Lord, have the power to resurrect and I want to be among those who are resurrected. And all those sentiments are fine. All those sentiments are true. But I think there's even more that God wants us to appreciate and understand about this story. It's not just about a little girl coming back from the dead. What is the message today? How does it apply to me? Is there a deeper meaning I can understand? I want to read another story. I don't often just read directly from a book when I preach, but sometimes the book does such a good job, I just I don't want to try to do it myself. Um, this is from Mark Buchanan in his book, Things Unseen. Now, he's Canadian, but don't hold that against him, okay? He's still an okay guy. Um, and he's a pastor up in Canada right now still, and uh, he writes this story about 20 years ago. Last February, I flew to Edmonton for three days of meetings. Edmonton, someone once said, is not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. 
It is flat and barren and frozen. The day I arrived, a Sunday afternoon, the temperature was around minus 40 degrees, a coldness that makes the air brittle, the ground rigid, the nights dark and as long as death. Step outside and cold needles through every inch of your clothing. Your breath plumes in your face, specter-like, and swarms over you. In the night, probably around 1 a.m., an 18-month-old girl named Erica woke up. She was in bed beside her mother, who slept on. Erica, in a sleep-like trance, perhaps, got up, walked around the house, and then somehow managed to get out the back door through the kitchen. She walked barefoot on the frozen earth, leaving footprints in the snow, tiny and delicate, like the faint stain that flower petals make when crushed between the pages of a heavy book. They strew aimlessly, these footprints, a shuffling, twining pattern. They don't go far. Twenty feet from the house, Erica laid down, curled up, and died. Her mother woke early, around five in the morning, and the first thing she noticed was that Erica was missing. She felt her absence intuitively at first, an ache, a silence, a premonition, a hollowness in her own flesh. She jumped up. She searched the house, calling her daughter's name, and then she saw the back door ajar. She stepped out and saw the loops of tiny footprints stitched in the snow, round and round and round, a journey of desolation going nowhere. And then she saw her baby. She ran over. She picked Erica up, cradling her tight, calling her name. She took her in the house, wrapped her thick in woolen blankets. Erica was frozen, hard as porcelain, blue as sky. The mother wept, shouted, prayed, Jesus, help. Please don't let my baby die. Somehow she managed to phone 911. The paramedics came and they rushed Erica and her mother to the hospital where a team of doctors awaited. Erica arrived and she was pronounced dead. But the doctors worked anyhow. They began a painstaking process of thawing her tiny, frail, stiff body. And an astonishing thing happened next. Erica's little heart twitched. Then it fluttered. And then it began to beat with a slow, aching thrum. A moth shaking water off of rain-soaked wings. A butterfly curling up out of its chrysalis. Blood, warm, red blood suffused her. It brushed color down through her limbs. Her body softened her arms and legs unlocking out of their angular rigidity. She began to breathe. Then Erica woke up. That was Sunday. By the time I left on Wednesday afternoon, Erica had fully recovered. She was alert, hungry, smiling, laughing. Even her toes and fingers had received back their life. Now her mother, well, she lives in a kind of reverie, permanently wonderstruck with no prognosis of recovery. Remember how it said they were completely astonished? Now I imagine that the moment Erica's heart started again, everything was forever altered. And I don't mean this in some kind of mawkish fairy tale sense. I know that Erica's mother will have moments of aggravation and anger with her daughter, have experiences typical to all parents, wishing that her girl would shut the door without slamming it, or that she'd clean her plate before leaving the table. But I doubt that she will ever kiss her Erica goodnight again without a rush of dread and thanksgiving sweeping over her. Hmm. I'm sure she'll never watch Erica thread a needle or pirouette in ballet class or twirl her hair on a pencil while she chats on the phone and not want to clap her hands and leap to her feet, exulting. I imagine that both mother and daughter will forever carry a sense of destiny. Erica will grow up hearing the story over and over. You died and came alive, dead as stone, but even the stones shall sing. 
Her mother will remember all this, treasuring it in her heart, shouting it from the rooftops, even into her decrepitude. When age bends and crumples her and strips her memory clean as a bone, that bone will be the one thing unforgettable. You died, my little girl, and now you live. It'll be more than just a pleat in their identity. It will be the very cloth out of which their identity is cut. Erica is resurrected. And strange and astonishing this, so are you. So are you. This isn't just Erica's story, and it's not just Jairus' daughter's story. It's our story. By the way, that's Erica 10 years later, Erica Nordby. She's known as the Miracle of Canada or the Ice Baby. That was at the 10-year anniversary of her ordeal. There's only four or five cases in all the pediatric, pediatric literature that are similar to hers. A true miracle. The Bible says, you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And the Father went out and found a Savior and called Him to you and brought Jesus into our experience because of His great love for His children. The Bible says you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And you say, well, pastor, that, that's different. These are literal things, and these, this is now spiritual. Well, which is more important? Your spiritual life or your physical? That's why Jesus said in the boat, why were you afraid? Someone greater than the storm is here. Why do you weep and have commotion? Someone greater than death is here. You have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. He goes on to say in Ephesians, For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. Oftentimes you'll read commentary and say, Oh, this is talking about when Jesus comes again in the second coming. That's not accurate. Through the entire writing of the book of Ephesians, Paul is arguing to the Ephesian church, You are now resurrected today. You're not waiting for a resurrection to come. You are resurrected individuals now. You were dead in your sins. A sickness had come into your life that had destroyed you until Jesus came and whispered in your ear, Talitha Kum, my little child, the one that I love and created and made. Arise, arise to new life. Not the same life, a new life, a life of destiny. You live it now. Don't wait for it. Jesus Christ illustrated for all of our purposes his power and his plan. These incidents change our perspective in our world. All of us live a life of destiny, having passed from death into life, now, today, by faith. If you have heard his voice, if you have opened your heart, if you have asked for him to come into your life, then he has said, Talitha, kum. And you don't live the same life anymore. Live a resurrected life now. Not then, now. The Bible says that, Paul says that we have been crucified with Christ. And it's not our lives that we live anymore, but we live in Him. Our whole experience with Jesus Christ is based upon the reality that we are no longer living in the death of our sins, but that we have felt His touch, that He has taken our hand. 
while others may weep at our demise. Others may mock at the prospect that there's ever a chance that we can be redeemed and raised up. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I have a power. I have the plan. I have been called by the Father. And when I speak, the dead are raised. Live a resurrected life today. Live completely astonished at what Jesus has done for you. If you are finding yourself in your Christian walk bummed out, stalled, lifeless, listless. This story screams from the pages of Scripture. Live life astonished, permanently wonderstruck, is what Buchanan said about Erica's mother. Permanently wonderstruck at the miracle that God has done. Each and every person who's accepted Jesus Christ, you are twice a miracle. Once when God created you, from the mind and creativity of God and your mother's womb and brought you into existence. That is a miracle. But you are secondly a miracle in that God has also removed the stain of death and sin from your body and he has resurrected you to new life. You are twice miracles. If that does not make you completely astounded, friends, let's talk. Let's reintroduce you to the Jesus who does miracles. Listen to Jesus say, Talitha Kum to you. Reach out to him and say, Lord, I don't feel that life. I feel like the death is just right there still. The sins and the doubt, they're starting to overwhelm me. But when you read the story of a little girl, put yourself there and let yourself feel his breath on your face and hear the words of Jesus Talitha Kum my little child my little lamb it's time to get up it's time to arise there's still life there's still destiny and I want you to be with me forevermore in eternity Next time anyone asks you, what does Talitha Kum mean? What are you going to say? <laughs> we might just try that, Toby. <laughs> Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, all of us come to a point in our life of acknowledgement and enlightenment and opportunity and hope to understand what you are calling us to. I thank you for my family, and I thank you for my daughter. And I pray that she would always remember that she is made new in Jesus Christ, that she is your daughter, that you have redeemed her, and that you've given her destiny. And Lord, may that be all of us as well. Thank you for these wonderful stories. Thank you for the miracles that you do in our life. Help us to remember we live a resurrected life now. And all of our journeys will be different in that knowledge. We thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you the rest of your Sabbath day. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Remember, we will have services next week. <laughs>